Hello and welcome back to Indie Rebel VFX, Hollywood effects without a Hollywood budget. I'm your instructor, Chris Temple, and the purpose of this video is to help you get your software matching the software that I'll be using. We're gonna make sure that our keyboard shortcuts are set the same. I'm gonna show you some different window layouts and other things like that. And that's just gonna help make sure that we're on the same page so when you're following along at home, you're not getting lost. So if you've already got the software installed and you're ready to get started, follow along with this video and we'll get you up and running in no time. Okay, well let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off by taking a look at Blender and I will show you guys how I've customized that so that you'll be able to better follow along as we go through some of these tutorials. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Blender right now. Blender, for those of you who do not know, is a free and open source 3D animation, modeling, compositing, simulation package. We'll make this full screen here. And this is the basic Blender interface. And we'll go over this in more detail later on as we use Blender. But right now, let's just go ahead and get some things set up. The first thing I want to do is take a look at what my render engine is. And that's up here at the top of the screen. I have mine set to cycles. By default, it usually comes over here at Blender Render. So go ahead and set yours to cycles and we'll be using that quite a bit uh, as this course goes on. Now, in this first pane over here, this is your render settings tab, essentially. Uh, we have a bunch of different other tabs here that you can scroll through, and we'll be messing with a lot of these later on. But right now, the big one is in the render settings, and let's, let's just go ahead and make sure that your settings match mine here. So if you have a GPU, this is where you can enable that. Make sure that you're gonna be using your GPU. The other thing we want to do is make sure that under resolution, we have it set to 100%. The way this percentage works, you could say, is that if I knock this down to 50, it would be rendering at 1280 by 720. And, you know, the smaller the percentage, the smaller your frame actually is, even though you have it set here to 1920 by 1080, this is a percentage of what your resolution is. So 100% of 1920 by 1080 is what we want to do. Scrolling down a little bit further here, uh, under output, make sure you're set up with PNG RGBA 16-bit by default. That's just kind of a good image sequence that will work for us with a lot of the stuff we're doing while still being relatively lightweight. Occasionally, we will be working with OpenEXR multilayers, but we're not going to do that right now. By default, this is probably a good way to go. The other thing you can do is if you want to set your samples up, but really you change that depending on your project. But the final setting I want you to change is down here under Film. And if it's not dropped down, you can just hit the arrow. And we want to make sure that we have Transparent checked. And that's extremely important. I'll show you why. If I turn this off and I do a temporary render of my scene by pressing Shift-Z, you can see there's no transparency. All I'm seeing is this gray. But if I come down and I click Transparent, now you can see we have an alpha channel that we can work with. And this is going to come in handy later on as we start compositing our CG images on top of live action. I'm just gonna go and press Z to get out of this. And it takes me to wireframe mode. I press Z one more time and I get back to solid. That's how that works. At this point, go ahead and press Control U to update your user preferences and your startup files. So now whenever you start Blender, it's gonna start up with cycles. It's gonna start up with the same settings that we set up over here. Now we can go set up some other user preferences that will come in handy for us as well. Simply go to File, User Preferences, and this window pops up. Starting over here on the left, we'll go from left to right. We don't need to change anything in interface, and we do not need to change anything here in editing. But under input is where our first set of changes are. If you are working on a laptop computer or you have a gaming mouse of some sorts where the middle mouse wheel just scrolls and scrolls forever and it's really difficult to actually get a solid click out of it, then go ahead and check this box right here that says emulate three button mouse. This will allow you to use the Alt key in conjunction with left clicking to simulate having a three button mouse. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Scrolling down a little bit more, there's this one that says emulate number pad. Again, if you're on a laptop computer or some sort of computer that does not have a 10 key pad, you're going to want to check this. It makes transitioning through our different views a lot easier. And again, I'll show you that here as soon as we close out of this dialog box. Back up to the top. We have an add-ons tab. This is actually really helpful. You can find a lot of neat things in here to enable an add-on for Blender. We might do that as the course goes on, or you can choose to do it on your own. Themes is kind of fun. I personally am using one called Flatty Light, but uh, Back to Black is kind of nice if you've got a dark side. Science Lab is kind of fun. I like our theme. I've used this one a lot before. I kind of like the blue on it and such. 
Uh, Blender 2.4x is the old days of Blender. This is how it looked when I started learning it. But I find that Flatty Light looks really good. It's got a nice amount of contrast. And then finally, over here underneath System, this is where you would also set up your GPU options to then allow you to use your GPU over here in the render settings. So you can choose your compute device. I've got mine set to my CUDA card. You can see it's just a, a normal laptop GPU, but it definitely does make a difference, especially when I'm rendering. So after you've made these changes, just go and hit Save User Settings, and we can close that out. And now we're good to go. So to show you the Alt left click thing, in Blender something that's really weird is that if you choose to just left click in the scene, the crosshair comes around. You can't actually select it with left click. You select your objects with right click. And now you can select your objects like that, so that's pretty cool. And then if I hold Alt and left click and drag, you can see I can actually pivot and rotate around my scene. That's actually very nice. If I hold Shift Alt and left click around, I can actually pan my scene. So Alt rotates, Shift Alt allows me to pan. So that's why we did that. Now, emulate numpad. This is because the number pad, the 10 key pad, allows us to set our views. If I press one, it takes me to a front view, three takes me to the side, seven takes me to the top, and zero brings me to the camera. If I go back to one and I press five, I can toggle between orthographic, which is what you see right now, or 3D. And the same works from the top and from the side as well. So I'm just using five to toggle between those. And that really comes in handy as we're positioning objects within 3D space. So if you don't have a 10 keypad, emulating the numpad allows you to use the numbers across the top of your keyboard to do exactly what we've just done. So that's the basic setup for Blender. Let's go and jump into Natron now. I'm going to close Blender out. I don't need to save any of my changes. And now I'm going to fire up Natron. All right, well, welcome to Natron. This is the main Natron interface. And I have done some mild customization to mine. So let me go and walk you through what I have done. We're going to go up to Edit, Preferences. All right, from here, there's just a few things that I want to point out. If you have a GPU, there is an option to set up your GPU rendering here. That could come in very handy for you. I also want us to go ahead and go down here to where it says Node Graph. And go ahead and check this box that says Merge Node Connect to A Input. Without this box check, all of our merges will automatically go into the B input. And if you're coming from a Nuke background, you're used to it going into A. Now, some of you may be brand new to nodes and Natron. You're like, A, B, what the heck is Chris talking about? I promise it's all going to make sense, but for right now, I just need you to trust me. Please check this box so you're not confused later on in the course when my Natron is behaving differently than yours. Now, the other things I want to do are purely cosmetic, and the first one is down here in the node graph. And I have to come up with some custom colors for my nodes. For instance, I like to make my readers kind of a, a dark red color, and so you do it just by clicking on this little color wheel, and you can choose whatever color you want. I like kind of this deep red color for my read nodes. Um, sometimes, you know, maybe I'll do like a different gray one or something like that. But for the purposes of this course, we're going to keep it as kind of a dark red just like that, okay? The other thing I like to change is down here for the draw group. By default, the draw group is kind of a, a gray color like this, and it doesn't really stand out a lot. Now, coming from Nuke, I'm used to my rotos and such, which falls under draw. I'm used to those being this green color here. But given that generators are already in that green category, I'm going to make my draws this hot pink because I don't have any other color like that, as you can see. And it makes them really stand out. So again, what we're trying to do is color coordinate our nodes so that way when we're looking at them all here in the graph, we can tell what the nodes are without having to zoom in close to read what the node says. And again, that's going to make more sense as we go. So change your readers to kind of a, a blood red, change your draws to a fuchsia or hot pink, and your guys' then node graph will match mine. Next, let's go ahead and change main window underneath appearance. And in here, I've changed a few things, uh, the biggest of which is selection. By default, it came in as kind of a yellow color. So this is a selection. This little blue outline here is a selection. This viewer one here is selected. And I didn't like the yellow, it hurts my eyes a little bit. So for me, I like kind of this blue color. And if you're coming from an Adobe background, like After Effects, this is gonna make it a little bit more familiar for you. So go and change it to blue, or you can do whatever color you want, but if you want it to look like mine, that's the one I've changed. And when we're done with that, just go ahead and save our changes. Okay, so with that done, there's one other change I want to make, and that is up here 
in the top corner of our properties panel. This is called the properties panel over here. This is where we're going to change our effect settings for the individual nodes that we add. And what I want to change is this little number. By default, yours says 10. And what that means is I can have up to 10 nodes active in my graph at once and be able to change all those properties. Let me give you an example. You don't have to follow along. I just want to show you how this works. I'm going to bring in a couple different nodes. I'm going to bring in a checkerboard, some color bars, color wheel, a constant, and coming down here, maybe we add a merge and like a blur or something like that and a transform. Okay, so we've added a bunch of different nodes. At any given time, I can actually scroll through here and start changing the, the settings and the properties for all those nodes I've just added. Now that's actually extremely helpful for a lot of people, but I'm ADHD and this just drives me crazy. It's too much information to try to focus on at once and to try to pinpoint what it is that I wanna change. So my solution is I change this up here to one. And what that means is that the only node that will appear in my properties panel is whichever one I have selected by double clicking. So I can double click the constant and it pops up. I can double click the color wheel and it pops up. Color bars, same thing. Transform, same thing. I'm only dealing with one at a time. Now, occasionally I will want to link properties from one node to another. And in that case, all I have to do is change this to two. And then I only get two nodes at any given time. And it's really easy to just bounce between the two of them. I can see checkerboard and color wheel. In my mind, I can keep track of that and go from one to the next. As soon as I'm done linking my properties, I change this back to one and I can stay focused and not be distracted by what's going on over here. All right, so closing out of that, that concludes our software setup. So once again, if you haven't checked it out already, there is a text file in this module folder that has a list of all the software that we will be using. It shows you where you get it, as well as a few extra plugins that might come in handy for you as well. So go ahead and get your software downloaded, installed, and set up like mine, and I will see you in the next lesson.